Today in science, we have monumental scientists that we think about in the pantheons of the greatest scientists in the world. And there are people like Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, all these kind of brilliant people. And then a lot of people include Charles Darwin in there. Well, Charles Darwin is worthy of certain praise and worthy of certain critical awareness on the other side as well. That he's not that God that's up there. But he did make the most profound contribution because what Charles Darwin did was write up the concept of evolution in such a way that the average person could say, well, let me see, that sounds like a far better idea of how humans and the planet got into the situation it is now than the old version of Genesis. So Charles Darwin offered a scientific understanding that was available to the people, so he wrote it at that level. And yet he also, in doing that, helped uh, helped us evolve from a, a, a church-run world into a world based more on a scientific understanding of the universe. Well, well he did that. He also put a bias into the situation uh, that has really slanted the way we look at the world and how we fit into it. First of all, the theory of evolution was a theory by Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck from France. He wrote it 50 years before Darwin. It is the first and most valid understanding of evolution as a process that was scientifically published. So when Darwin got in there, he didn't introduce the concept of evolution. He was trying to introduce a mechanism of how evolution occurred that differed from the one that Lamarck presumably said how evolution occurred. And so we say, okay, so what was Darwin's contribution? Not the theory of evolution. It was the theory of this uh, competition and struggle for survival, that evolution is, a, is an ongoing struggle for fitness. Okay, that was how he said it was driven, and that was what came into the world. So we go back and say, well, where does it all come down to? I said, the theory of evolution was provided by Lamarck. A more natural understanding of the processes of evolution were introduced by a man called Alfred Russell Wallace. And he wrote a paper on the thing called natural selection. And he sent this manuscript to Charles Darwin, who had been working on some idea of a theory of evolution, but really had never come down to a point of commitment to actually say this is what it's all about. So Darwin's working on a theory of evolution. Wallace sends a theory of evolution. And he writes a note saying to Darwin, if you think this is worthy of a publication, would you please submit it to Charles Lyell, head of the Royal Society, for a paper for publication. Well, when Darwin received this, he broke down, he had an emotional bro breakdown because he was thinking he was going to be the provider of a theory of evolution for the world. And, uh, and he was a friend of Charles Lyell, head of the Royal Society. So he brought this manuscript over to Charles Lyell that Alfred Russell Wallace sent, a complete understanding in very few pages, an elegant scientific paper on a theory of evolution. And he brought it over and he said to Lyell, what, what should I do? Well, you remember, this is Victorian England. And Victorian England has class. There's an upper class and a lower class. Darwin comes from the upper class. Alfred Russell Wallace comes from the lower class. Well, the concept of a major scientific theory on evolution being provided by a lower class person was an anathema to Victorian aristocrats. You know, it's like you can't give credit to a to a low class human for this great theory. So they entered into, and that is Darwin and, and Lyle entered into what was called the delicate arrangement. And what they did is they changed the priority of the paper by saying that Darwin also has a paper on the theory of evolution, which he didn't have. So they reported at the meeting, which is a, a meeting of the Linnaean Society, they report a theory on evolution presented by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace was the only one with a paper. Darwin didn't even have a paper. They wrote an abstract to hastily put it in the front so that they would say that this was Darwin's work. You say, well, why is all this important at some point? Well, number one, it gives the emphasis that Darwin's point of view becomes the selected uh, uh, point of evolution for the masses because he is the primary presenter. They say, well, what do you mean point of view? It's evolution. I go, no. There's that old story, a glass is half full, a glass is half empty. It totally means two different things, so which way you look at it. Well, what's the difference between the Darwin version of Wallace's theory and Wallace's version? 
The difference is, think about living in either of two worlds. World number one, it's a constant struggle to survive, and the only way you can survive is to be in this competition for fitness. And the, there's winners and there's losers, and, and so you're out there to survive every day. You're in a rat race, and you gotta go out there because if you don't do it, somebody else is gonna beat you and you're gonna die. World one. World two, and this is the world of Alfred Russell Wallace, he said, the world of evolution is based on the elimination of the weakest. And so basically it says if you live in that world, then you strive not to be the weakest. Then you don't have to be in competition with so many others because the, it's only, you just don't want to be in the last couple. So that means you just have to work yourself up a bunch of couple of people rather than to be the top one in the entire pile. So I said, well, which planet would you like to live on? The one where you have to struggle every day to be on the top of the pile or the one where every day is all you have to make sure is, is you're not at the bottom of the pile. And you say, well, that's two different worlds. And we live in the Darwinian version world. And that Darwinian version world is the world of competition, struggle, violence, war, all as part of a biological necessity for evolution. And that there's an upper class. And they're the real leaders of evolution. And everybody else is the feeder layer. And that class consciousness and all that stuff. And I say, well, what does that lead to? And the answer is, you take Darwinian theory, you make scientific principle of, out of this theory, then you put it into political action, and you have Nazi Germany. And that is what you get from a Darwinian theory. friends and cultural creatives this is Bruce I'm back here for the December newsletter my how time is flying and so is the evolution as we keep our eyes open we see the world is in a state of upheaval and all of this is really a preparation a chaos that precedes the formation of a new world and this world that we're talking about is the one I've written about with Steve in spontaneous evolution and it's very interesting because we talk about evolution as the coming together of individual units, coming together to form community, and this is a pattern of evolution. And it's interesting because even the motto of the United States, E Pluribus Unum, and it says, from the many come one. And this is exactly what the evolution of the whole world is about to experience, and it's really part of the whole U.S. motto and the credo of what our country was built on. And so while we're seeing this evolution and chaos start, we're also seeing the action of Occupy Wall Street. This is a visual representation of the change and evolution that's in front of us right now. And why this is important is this is people standing up for a simple reality. The world is not sustainable. It is no longer supporting us, and we must make a change in our behavior to take us out of an inevitable extinction and into a world we can thrive into. And it's very interesting because at this time, what is Occupy Wall Street all about? It's really talking about how the moneyed interest, how the corporate presence is actually changing the course of human evolution. And why I really want to bring this up is because rather than talking about the corporate presence, we are really talking in the political arena about uh, whether there should be more government or less government. One side says government is way too big, take it apart and throw it away. And the other side is saying, no, government is needed to really help us secure a, a uniform and healthy future. And to me, this is the most important point. It's not the question of whether more or less government is important. It's actually the question of corruption of government. Government is great. Government keeps us all together. In the human body, we have 50 trillion cells. All the cells have different jobs, whether they work for the heart, whether they work for the digestive system, whether they work for the lungs, they all have their different jobs. But there's a government. The government is called the nervous system, the central nervous system. The nervous system's function is not to tell how individual cells should carry out their jobs and what they should do in their day-to-day -day life. The function of the government of the body, which is called the brain, is actually to coordinate the actions of all the different entities to work in harmony toward a collective end. And this is exactly what the role of government should be. The government should be there to do two fundamental things. Protect each citizen's rights so that they can live the life that we talk about in the pursuit of happiness. 
but it's also there to protect the commons. And this is one of the most important uh, missions of a government is to make sure that we do not destroy the environment, do not destroy our water, our air, in the process of seeking corporate greed. And yet, the government is now corrupt. We also say, okay, let's get rid of the government. In fact, is that be throwing the baby out with the bathwater? The whole thing we must do is get corruption out of the government. The rules of the government are necessary and imperative. I do not trust General Motors to make sure that I live in an area or atmosphere with clean air and clean environment. I would not leave that to corporations to decide how my world should be kept because corporations are self-serving and only looking for a profit. I'm looking for a government that is free of corruption, a government free of the manipulation by the private industry and the private money to give them the world that they seek at the expense of our world. So the argument, more government, less government? No, wrong argument. The whole point should be government without corruption. We need this as the brain is responsible for coordinating the functions of 50 trillion citizens called cells in my body. We need our government to help us coordinate our behavior and integrate our lives so that we then create a much more wholesome and thrivable future. So while we're out there and the Christmas season is coming and Occupy Wall Street is gonna get a little pressure from mother nature, the whole point is this, keep the movement alive. Keep this change going. It is our passport to a future where we can survive, thrive, and live on this planet in the way we were meant to, the Garden of Eden. This is what we were provided with, and this is where we shall return. And I hope you see that as part of our December issue of thinking about what we can do for the future, what we can do for ourselves, and what we can do for our beautiful mother planet, Gaia. I wish you a happy holiday season, and I look forward to seeing you again in January. Thank you.